So here we are in the brand new Land Rover Defender, doing the sort of off-roading the owners of this car will be doing nearly every day. Using the low ratio gearbox, the great ground clearance, and all those clever electronics that can shuffle power between individual wheels to maximize traction in slippery conditions. Except that isn't really true, is it? Because although Land Rover likes to bang on about how good its cars are off-road, the reality is the vast majority of owners, even of this new Defender, which is supposed to be a more rugged alternative to a Range Rover or even a Discovery, will probably never do anything more than venture onto a muddy field during summer fate season. And that's why we're starting this review in what might well be the Land Rover capital of the UK, Cobham in Surrey. So I'm just driving down the high street now and I'll show you what I mean. There's a Range Rover Sport, there's a Discovery, there's an Evoque, there's another Range Rover Sport. And actually just down that side road there, there's an original Defender. Not a mud rut or a sand dune in sight, but there is a Waitrose, a school that kids now need to get to again, some coffee shops and many, many restaurants. So in this review, we'll be finding out how well the Defender is suited to the things it'll actually be used for most of the time, including carrying people, carrying shopping and parking in tight car parks. But don't worry, we will of course be doing a bit of off-roading as well, partly for those handful of buyers who are actually considering a Defender as a workhorse, but mainly because it's jolly good fun. But before we get properly started, make sure you're subscribed to the channel and that you've switched on notifications by clicking on the bell icon below. If you don't do that, we can't let you know about some of the really exciting reviews and group tests we've got coming up over the next few weeks. So let's start by having a good look around inside the Defender because there's lots to like in here. So for starters, you feel like you're sitting higher up than you do, even in a lot of big SUVs. So you've got this really towering driving position with broad, comfortable seats and all versions get at least part electric seat adjustment. And actually, although the interior looks more utilitarian than it does in other Land Rover models, so you've got these exposed bolt heads here, some showing body work and hard plastics on a lot of the dashboard, it doesn't feel at all cheap. It just feels more solid and robust than particularly luxurious. And it's the same thing with these part fabric seats that you get on most trim levels. So in a Range Rover, for example, they'd seem completely out of place. But here, they actually feel totally appropriate. Although if you do want full leather, you can have it either on the very top trim levels or if you're prepared to pay extra. Now the buttons and knobs on the dashboards of Land Rovers are all designed to be used while you're wearing gloves. So that's why they're quite chunky and they're clearly marked as well. And it makes adjusting the air conditioning, for example, really easy because there's no faffing around with the touchscreen or anything like that. And it's the same story with these buttons on the steering wheel, actually. They're quite big, they're easy to find, and you get this enormous 12.3 inch digital display behind the steering wheel. So that shows your speed, the engine revs, obviously, but also sat nav directions or what music you've got playing. And you get that on all models apart from the very entry level trim. But even the cheapest trim level gets this 10 inch touchscreen infotainment system. It's called PV Pro and it's quite a lot more intuitive and it's quicker to respond to presses than the old touch pro system that you get in a lot of Land Rover models, including the Discovery. As you'd expect, you get smartphone mirroring for Apple and Android devices as standard. And you can also set this up as a Wi-Fi hotspot and view various off-road information that you may or may not ever need. On the options list, there's wireless phone charging and you can also upgrade the sound system as well. Storage space is very good as well. You've got this huge cubby here under the central armrest, got a small ledge in front of it and you've got all this space underneath here. It's great for throwing wallets, phones, keys, face masks, whatever else you want to. You've also got two cup holders here that are at a nice height, easy to reach, and the door pockets, well, they're quite big as well, can easily fit a bottle of one and a half litre water. Now we are in a supermarket car park at the moment, so bear with me, because I'm just gonna do a quick bit of shopping. Five minutes later. Right, so I've just bought some lunch and a few snacks for later on, and someone has helpfully parked in the space directly behind me, which in most cars would be no problem at all. But in the Defender, yeah, that isn't really gonna work, is it? But assuming there aren't any obstacles close behind and you can swing open the Defender's enormous side hinge tailgate, you'll actually find a lot of space inside. Not quite as much as in a Volvo XC90 or Audi Q7, admittedly, but certainly a lot more than in a Jeep Wrangler. And because the floor is covered in non-slip plastic, it's really easy to wipe down. What about carrying people? Well, this is the Defender 110, which essentially means it's the version with rear doors and you get five seats as standard. And as you can see, there is loads of knee room here, there's loads of headroom as well. 
And for a little bit extra, the exact price varies slightly depending on trim level. You can add a sliding and reclining function for the rear seats. For just over a thousand pounds, you can add a third row of seats, which this car has. And as you can see, headroom is pretty good, but legroom isn't brilliant. Certainly not as good as it is in a Discovery, let alone something like a BMW X7. I'm just over six foot. I wouldn't fancy a long journey in the back here unless the person sitting in front of me and the person sitting in front of them were both quite short. But for a school run, as long as you don't need Isofix mounting points right back in the third row, it'll be absolutely fine. And it's actually quite light and airy, partly because this car has the optional panoramic glass roof, but also because of these cool little roof lights up here. We haven't tested it yet, but in the near future, Land Rover will be launching a shorter three-door version of the Defender called the 90. That model will have a significantly smaller boot, but you'll still be able to squeeze up to six people inside thanks to an optional jump seat between the driver and front passenger. Now, to some people, especially a lot of us motoring journalists, actually, criticising the original Defender is a bit like swearing at the Queen. It's just not the done thing. The Defender was and still is an institution. It's a British icon. But the truth is, it was terrible to drive on the road. I mean, really quite unpleasant. And that's understandable because it was ancient and it was never a car designed to perform well on tarmac. Whereas, as I've already said, this new car is going to be bought by a lot of people who will never take it off-road. So it's a good thing that its on-road manners are a lot, lot better than its predecessors. So let's start with the engines. This car has the more powerful of two two-litre diesels. It has around about 240 brake horsepower and performance is perfectly adequate actually. It'll do 0-60 in around about eight seconds. And more importantly, it will pull really well from low rev. So the fact there's no six-cylinder diesel option isn't really an issue. It isn't the quietest engine in the world compared with some of the best luxury SUVs you can buy for this sort of money, but importantly, it's not irritatingly noisy and you also don't feel much in the way of vibration coming up through the steering wheel and the floor of the car, which you certainly do in a lot of proper off-roaders. And I know I just said there were no six-cylinder diesel engines, but shortly after we filmed this video, Land Rover announced that it sold out of two-litre diesel models and decided to replace those engines with three-litre diesels that have mild hybrid technology. There is a small price increase, as you'd probably expect, and the new engines aren't due to go into production until early next year. But if you order a diesel-powered Defender now, that's what you'll end up getting. If you don't want a diesel, take a look at the 2.0-litre P300 petrol, which has about 300 brake horsepower, so it's a lot quicker than either of the diesels. But the fastest engine in the range is actually a 3.0-litre petrol called the P400. That has around about 400 brake horsepower, so performance is really, really quite quick, but it's also very expensive. It costs around £80,000, partly because it's only available with range-topping X-Trim. Obviously, all versions have four-wheel drive and all 110 models, which is the car I'm driving now, have air suspension as standard. And that allows you to raise or lower the height of the car and get yourself up to 291 millimeters of ground clearance, which is more than you get in a Jeep Wrangler. And the air suspension also gives a reasonably comfortable ride. I do say reasonably because if you drive a really good road-biased SUV at the moment, something like a Audi Q7 or a BMW X5, for example, then you will notice yourself being rocked from side to side a little bit more in the Defender and it doesn't cushion bigger impacts quite as well. But certainly compared with other SUVs that are primarily designed to go off-road, and I'm really talking about cars like the Jeep Wrangler and the Toyota Land Cruiser here, this car is really quite comfortable. It deals with all bumps quite well, but it's particularly smooth when you get it on faster roads and you're doing 50, 60, 70 miles an hour. And it's a similar story when it comes to handling, really. There are SUVs that go around corners better than this. It doesn't have a huge amount of grip and the steering's quite slow. So on the whole, this car doesn't really appreciate being asked to change direction quickly. But no one who buys it is going to expect something remotely sporty. And as long as you keep things smooth and you're not going too quickly, this is a perfectly pleasant thing to bumble along in. Right, so there is, I'm told, a pretty good off-road track down here. So let's give it a go. Now, the truth is, along green lanes like this, at least at this time of the year, the Defender isn't even breaking sweat. But a couple of days ago, we did do some more serious off-roading alongside a Jeep Wrangler and as a benchmark for more road-biased SUVs, a Volvo XC90. As you'd probably expect, the Defender was in a completely different league to the XC90 and managed to complete all of the tests we threw at it. Although a Wrangler 
did need less of a run up to get up some of the steeper mud slopes. That's despite our car having the optional off-road capability pack, which adds a more advanced traction control system to help the Defender claw its way through different types of terrain. But here are five more things you'll want to know about the new Defender if you're thinking about buying one. Prices start at around about £40,000 for the soon-to-be-launched three-door 90 model and £45,000 for this longer 110. If you plan to put people in the back on a regular basis, then the 110 model is the one to go for, so it's no surprise it's expected to be the bigger seller. We wouldn't rule out the entry-level trim because although you get steel wheels rather than alloys, they actually work quite well with what's supposed to be a functional look. But if you want LED headlights and part leather seats, you will need to go for at least S-trim, which is what this car is. CO2 emissions are pretty horrendous by modern standards, with even the diesel versions pumping out more than 230 grams per kilometre. So as well as not being particularly eco-friendly, this car is actually in the top 37% band for company car tax. Ouch. On the plus side, depreciation is expected to be very slow indeed. This car is actually expected to hold on to its value better than a Porsche Macan, and far, far better than cars like the Jeep Wrangler and the Toyota Land Cruiser. Land Rover has a shocking reputation for reliability and finished rock bottom of our latest reliability survey once again. Hopefully this will mark a fresh start for the British brand, but I wouldn't hold your breath. So what's the verdict on the new Defender? Well, in theory, this should be one of the least fashionable cars you can buy right now because the fact that it's so tall and boxy and heavy makes it really quite inefficient. And it isn't even as though most owners are gonna be using its off-road ability very much at all. And yet somehow this absolutely is one of the trendiest cars you can buy right now. So as long as you aren't looking for exceptional on-road driving manners, then the Defender should definitely be on your shortlist. But for lots more information, head over to our website, whatcar.com, where you'll find our detailed 16-point review of the Defender. And if you've enjoyed this video, then give it a like, leave us a comment. And other than that, we'll see you next time.